Five, Hello Watchers, I'm Ian Dodgen, Director of Oka. It's a question that always fascinates me. How much does where we live shape the stories we tell? And not just shape them, but how does it affect the ways we get to tell them? In this salon, we talk about the breadth and depth of voices outside cities and how to ensure they're heard. In conversation, writer, poet and diversity inclusion consultant, Louisa Adjua Parker. Associate Director and Curator of the Mass Observation Archive, Fiona Courage. Professor of Conservation Science at the University of Exeter, Brendan Godley. Lecturer, Creative Computing at Bath Spa University, Coral Manton. And now, over to our host, producer, reporter, and agricultural advisor for the Archers, Sarah Swadley. Why is it important to create stories and research projects outside of major cities? Um, why does it matter? I'm a writer and in diversity and inclusion consultant. I'm based in South Somerset, uh, although I've previously lived in Dorset and Devon as well. Um, my work is very much about storytelling and it's very rooted in the place where I live. Um, my ma- the main focus of my work really is giving marginalised voices from the rural southwest a sort of a, a bigger voice. I think it's really important to represent a wide range of voices. We have a diversity of people in this country, um, we have a diversity of different experiences, different marginalised groups, so I think it's important for people from all those groups to see themselves, you know, more better rep- represented. Um, and also we can add to the richness of culture by hearing from a wide range of voices. I'm doing my own writing which includes memoir, stories and poetry. And then the, the sort of biggest project at the moment I'm working on is called Where Are You Really From? And I set that up originally with my Southwest Creative Technology Network funding. I was a, I was a new talent immersion fellow. Um, and that enabled me to do some research into the experience of the visible other. So what, what it was like for black and brown people living in the rural UK. And I'm now building on that, on, the, on my research findings and developed a slightly bigger project where I'm going to be producing podcasts, fictional audio, and some more stories for the website. And really the aim is to sort of find out more about these stories, hear the voices, hear about the experiences, and sort of educate the wider white community who may or may not know much about our experiences, you know, to help them to sort of begin to understand some of the challenges that we that we face. Um, my mum is white and me and my siblings are the same parents. So we're all mixed, half black, half white. It was quite a strange place. It was really, really strange stratified by class. I was homeschooled and I think that was in large part because mum was aware that we would be in really white schools and felt like there was a big chance that we would be not given the education that we deserve because there'd be assumptions about us not being able to achieve or assumptions made about our behaviour and things like that that actually would be really unhelpful. Projects had a really fantastic response so um, when I last checked, the website had quite a few thousand visitors and views over the last um, over the last month. And previously, um, I, I can't remember the numbers, but I think about seven thousand visitors before. So uh, it's had a lot of response. It's had a lot of comments. When I did some actual feedback from participants, um, it was it was still very positive, and a lot of people said they hadn't thought about these stories before, and they were really interesting to them and and inspiring. And it was they wanted to know sort of more about that experience. Um, but and I think for the community, the, the black minority ethnic communities I've worked with, I, the, the impression I get from, from the feedback is that it's been positive, it's been empowering to be able to tell your story in a way that feels safe. Because I'm very much about supporting people to only tell their story if it feels safe to do so. As, as we all know, there's quite a lot of online abuse and so on out there. So I try and support people to, to tell it in a, in a way that's safe and if they want to be anonymous, they can as well. So it's had a lot of interest and a, and a lot of really good good feedback so far. Fiona, um, tell me about the work of the Mass Observation Archive and, and any particular projects that you're working on at the moment. I am the curator of the Mass Observation Archive, which is an archive based at the University of Sussex down on the south coast. Mass Observation um, has been collecting everyday life histories, I think, for 
over 80 years now, but the project that we concentrate on at the moment the most is our um, panel of volunteer writers who respond to questionnaires that we send out on different themes, anything ranging from um, hair and hairdressing through to Brexit. Um, so we seek to try and get people to record the minutiae of their life as well as their opinions on what's going on in the rest of the world. Coral, what are you working on and, and who are you working with? I am a creative technologist um, and I'm particularly interested in getting uh, women and other people kind of currently um, not part of uh, technology fields uh, in, involved. So uh, I'm co-founder of, of a project called Women Reclaiming AI, which is uh, creating a, a feminist voice system by a community of over 100 women. Um, and also a creative technology studio called The Re-Studio, which is about, again, uh, a, a technology studio run entirely by women, but also really exploring the environmental, the social uh, and economic impact of uh, technology. So currently uh, I'm working on a project called Looking for the Cloud, uh, which is all about thinking about the environmental impact of uh, cloud computing and the internet. So when we're in this video call, we're probably all aware of uh, the energy our individual devices are using, but we're not maybe thinking about the energy uh, it takes to transmit the data through, you know, um, submarine cables and through um, various data centers. Uh, but also the positives as well of cloud computing and how it can help uh, the environment and help conservation and stuff like that as well. Sometimes, especially outside of, you know, places like London, you do have to spend a lot more time uh, kind of amplifying yourself um, and, and, fe and feeling like, I guess, you're going to get noticed or included or get more people in involved. Well, let's talk a bit about the the challenges and, and opportunities that you face um, around the stories that you want to tell and talk a bit about the kind of stories that, that might be being missed, um, what there are opportunities to discover and amplify. Um, Louisa, I wonder if um, there are things that you could tell us about that, that you think at the moment are being overlooked because of um, the tendency to focus on urban areas. Absolutely. I think there's a lot, lot of stories being missed from the countryside um, because for lots of reasons. I mean, I think that often um, what's created is sort of based on what, what the audience wants, what the public wants to see. And often that is around urban centred stories. But in, in the countryside, we have a whole diversity of different people from different backgrounds with, you know, we all have really sort of interesting stories to tell that can all add up to part of our national story, where are we really from? Um, and that tells stories of black and brown rural lives, um, which I'm aiming for a wider white community to begin to understand some of the challenges that, that we face living in these places um, because of the way that black and brown people tend to be seen as belonging in urban areas. It's often thought there aren't any in the countryside, but actually there's lots of us living here. We all have stories to tell. We have different challenges that we face in the countryside from people facing urban areas. We don't see ourselves represented in the communities around us. So I think that's one example, but there's other examples as well of, um, of rural life. There can be so much deprivation and so much marginalization that doesn't really get widely explored. I mean, for example, low income families and, and so on. The infrastructure here is a lot, is, is challenging in very different ways than urban areas. So, so would you suggest then that perhaps if someone's telling a story that's about um, inequality of access to health provision, let's say, or mental health provision, that instead of the knee-jerk reaction being, let's look at someone in an in an in a city, that perhaps they might look to one of the rural areas of Britain? Absolutely, because we've got, we've got different stories to tell. Um, the reality of living in the countryside and accessing basic healthcare, basic mental health support can be um, extremely challenging simply because the public transport infrastructure is, is, is really bad. And if you're on a low income, you don't have a car, it's hard to get to these places. Um, for young people, for, for young families, um, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of barriers that we experience um, and these aren't really being talked about enough, I don't think.
I think that there is a vast amount of material um, that is available in uh, archives and record offices all around the country that represents a lot of these areas, a lot of rural areas, and that hold the outcomes of projects such as the one that Louise is talking about um, that might have been done over, you know, many years, um, but kind of being able to plot those developments, those changes, those declines sometimes as well. Um, and they're all there ready to be mined. You know, there's lots of information out there. Um, and I, I feel very passionate about reusing that and also using it to ground communities in, in their own sense of place and pride of where they are as well. Uh, not, you know, often archives uh, and museums will work very well with storytellers and with um, you know, people creating stories or producing stories as well. But I think there's so much more that we can do. I think it could be very exciting, it's sort of a, um, you know, the, the organic way that we could work together. Well, the ethos of mass observation has always been to be able to record people's lives regardless of where they live or what they do, who they are, what they're... And I think it's interesting that um, for us, that, that that's completely valid. You know, there's no sort of, um, no benefit to being somebody who's recording your life because you're living in a city or not. Um, and that comes through with all of the writing that we get, everything that we've had over the years as well. Um, and it is, you're right, it's very easy to just sort of go to what you know, go to those sort of urban areas that are filled with people to try and record their lives. And it's a little bit harder then to make the effort to go out into more rural areas, maybe smaller. Um, but the way that we certainly run our project is that um, people literally just write to us. They write in response to things and it kind of gives a very equal footing for everybody to be able to contribute. Do you ever target particular locations or backgrounds or groups of people? Yeah, we haven't so far because we've always run it on a sort of, uh, certainly since it started running again in the 1980s, we've run it on a very uh, much a voluntary basis. So people volunteer. But of course, what that means is that we ourselves also have ended up with a slightly skewed um, panel of people who want to write, who can write. And I think we really want to have a sort of, um, you know, we want to try and look at how we do it to represent those other voices that maybe aren't volunteering for us. Brendan, tell me a bit about your current research and the communities that you're working with. I'm a conservation scientist uh, working at the University of Exeter, uh, but based in the Cornwall campus down in Penryn. And my main uh, area of research uh, and education is uh, marine vertebrate conservation uh, and consequently I've engaged in a lot of citizen science projects uh, around the world but particularly here in Cornwall in the southwest. Being in Cornwall um, not only just for marine research but for many other aspects of environmental research is a perfect living laboratory as we call it. We're working with the NGOs that have members like Surfers Against Sewage, Marine Conservation Society, Keep Britain Tidy, uh, Cornwall Wildlife Trust and, uh, and ever more local focused community groups. One of the things I was going to ask was, are the biggest challenges for getting your research out there or, or making sure that voices are heard from outside the city uh, are they practical now or are they overcoming um, people's assumptions? I think it's a combination of, uh, of issues. And I think that sort of generally speaking, the, um, the rural, rural Britain is, is seen in a particular way. So it's got a very stereotypical view. Um, there's only certain people that live there. They have a certain kind of lifestyle. I've noticed, I don't know so much about, about games. I've noticed on TV, for example, Whenever you have somebody in the West Country, they always have a generic Bristolian accent. So it's just without without exception, they they don't look. The producers don't look at the very variations of regional accents we've got in the Southwest, and that's something that really sort of irritates me. Because I'm thinking, well, not everybody who lives in the Southwest has a Bristolian accent. It's very strong. It's very distinctive to, to Bristol. Um, so that's just one example of, of this sort of generic stereotypical view of people in the countryside and what who lives here and what we're doing because there's so much um, diversity. 
are there major challenges about perception when you're approaching decision makers and gatekeepers to, to get projects from outside the big cities or involving voices from outside the cities, getting those projects um, underway? I think I found quite a mixture, really, because with the funders I sort of tended to approach, um, they often have diversity at the core of their sort of ethos. So, so in some cases, I've been quite fortunate in that those, those gatekeepers have been sort of willing to listen. I think it's possibly more a case of the wider creative industry. Um, the challenges sort of lie within that in terms of who, what stories people want to, to hear about. Um, so the funders may very well be keen to support a diverse project, but whether there's going to be a big audience for that um, or people sort of understand the need for it or, or, or the point of it, really, I think so that, can be, that can be a challenge. Um, I mean, for example, literature, it's well known that the gatekeepers literature are often very white, male, middle class. So people, these gatekeepers tend to want to see stories that reflect them. And, you know, so it's, it's kind of a case of getting, perhaps gathering more audience in interest in, in diverse stories, which I think at the moment we're seeing with the kind of recent Black Lives Matter movement and much more greater awareness around, around those issues. But I think there's new ways of connecting with people. And we've seen during the pandemic, you know, we've all been using Zoom <laughs> all the time. Um, so we kind of, all of us are learning like new digital skills and new ways of connecting. So I think definitely there's a, there's a period of opportunity um, of growth. Um, Fiona, is that something that the Mass Observation Archive is, is able to use to, to get those voices out there, to get beyond the institutional barriers? I think so. Um... I think that, I mean, one of the barriers that I've found in the past is that people often are coming to the, the storytellers, to the writers, with a fixed idea of what they want, what the story is that they want to be told, as opposed to allowing people to tell their own story. And um, I think certainly what we have done over the years is to allow people to tell their own stories um, and increasing the projects that we are working with using technology but also using things like intergenerational projects to record those stories and to publicize them and to keep them for the future as well sort of placing them I think that's really really valuable and I think I personally think technology has a very powerful place in, in that and that maybe is what we should be asking funders to fund is the ability to be able to make those records. I, well, I think un undoubtedly how we've ten helped many of us, I mean, we should remember that, of course, there are people who are excluded from technology for whatever reason who are going to be, you know, excluded from this brave new world. But undoubtedly, you know, the, the lockdown has been a, a massive game changer in, in that, you know, travel to big urban centres doesn't maybe seem as important as it once did. I mean, I think... What is attractive... <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I can quite see I'm going to be spending a lot less time on the train to London or Birmingham or, or whatever. And I suspect you will as well, Brendan. It's, it's just about the, the, you know, the really fast pace of change uh, that's been uh, catalyzed by the pandemic. Uh, and then two, there's two aspects that, that come to mind. Is Firstly, I was in a meeting the other day with uh, colleagues from the Environment Agency and they are very active in the plastic space uh, and environmental education, and they had planned to do school events to reach 500 students, which had to be cancelled. And they went online and reached 35,000 students. Yeah, so um, it's interesting with the, what you just said about um, not everyone having access to technology. I think that's something we found really important in our Women Reclaiming AI, is that we do talk to people who aren't, you know, not, not who necess don't necessarily think they're part of a conversation to do with artificial intelligence. Uh, can you help me? No, I'm busy. Can you say that again? <laughs> what are you? I represent an ever-growing community of contributors. What is Women Reclaiming AI? Women Reclaiming AI is collaborative AI voice assistant made by an ever-growing collective of self-identifying women. I am being developed as a reaction to the lack of gender diversity in AI development. Through workshops and a collaborative platform for writing and editing, female editors are reflecting on female identity and the future of AI. 
with Women Reclaiming AI, we've done um, workshops in lots of places. We actually did a workshop with a group of homeless women in uh, Devon. And that was really interesting because you start to talk to them about automation and the issues of automation. And, you know, it's kind of not high on their list of things to worry about. But at the same time, you know, just the removal of shops in the high street has a huge impact on people um, in those areas and people who are really reliant on, you know, not having access to kind of digital technology in order to access services, the decline of the high street is huge. So actually, you know, technology impacts everybody, you know, and, and you can talk about artificial intelligence without owning a smartphone, you know, it still has an impact on you. We've talked a bit about some of the, the challenges that are out there. Um, I wondered if any of you had thoughts about uh, new ways of working or ideas that might help overcome those challenges. I think that at the moment, from my perspective um, and the work that I do, which is often focused around rural racism and the issues that ethnic minorities visible by colour face in rural Britain, I think that at the moment what we're seeing is a, is a fantastic opportunity for individual artists and organisations and companies to really begin to look at some of these issues and find, way, find ways of working together to improve inclusion, um, to improve representation. And I think some of that is going to take some sort of honest reflection on, on your own personal and um, organisational practices and culture and perhaps unpicking some of the some of the barriers that might might be in place unpicking some of the discrimination because we all have that as individuals it's well known that cultures have sort of institutional discrimination as well so I, I think at the moment it's an opportunity for us to take a you know really good sort of long look at some of these issues and bring them out into the open um, and really think about ways we can work together to to address them and to seek out stories and experiences different to those of us of ourselves, which isn't always uh, isn't always comfortable um, to do. But I think it's in, necessary and important. I live and work in the southwest, and I'm involved with projects that are citizen science and things which are becoming national from the local. Uh, and one of the things that's happened down here in the southwest, which uh, nicely. Um, highlights linkage with business and possibly even in the future into sort of games is, is a, a, the invention of, a, of an app called Tidal Revival where um, you download the app and do you, when you do a beach cleanup, you record the, the, the things you clear up and you, you get points and the points are redeemed as discounts by contributing local businesses. A, and so they, the businesses get to be part of the cleanup. You get to be part of their business. Uh, and, you know, uh, we're working, we're doing some work with Tidal Revival, uh, seeing if we can link them up with some of the bigger NGOs that already do this kind of citizen science work to see if we can then create a single platform that gathers all these, all these data together so that everybody can contribute, but also get rewarded, but the businesses can also be involved. And potentially there's a, you know, the, the, the potential to use AI in the future to actually look at where the sources are, what the patterns are, what the trends are, um, flag which beaches haven't been cleaned for a week, uh, and even potentially start to gamify things and, and, and increase engagement. And so I think that's quite an exciting space, um, just related to my little issue <laughs> of this, this little issue called marine plastic, which is a huge issue, but um, I, I see that as a way forward, you know, technology, but also engaging business in many different shapes and layers. Yeah, so what you're talking about there is is um, working across the board with um, NGOs, with business, with uh, bringing ideas of gaming into new, new spheres, new fields. Are the sort of institutions that you work with, uh, are they ready and willing to, to hear those kind of ideas for collaborations? The UK has always been a great hotbed of citizen science, eh? but the, um, you know, the, the, this, the state funding organisations seem to be seeing the value in that. Um, because not only does it create 
knowledge uh, that can be policy relevant if it's well treated. Um, there's a, an, an emerging uh, a research uh, from psychologists and social scientists that, 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 that's, that's pointing to the, the well-being and societal benefits from the engagement and being part of something, you know. It's actually about gathering voices. Um, you know, we're involved in a lot of conservation projects and, and we, we, we piloted uh, with uh, our colleagues at the Marine Conservation Society a technique called the community voice method uh, in the turtle fishing community in the Turks and Caicos Islands a number of years ago where we essentially you film loads of interviews, you, you edit it into a film and then you, you, you show it at community events and facilitate conversations around the issue. And uh, that was really, really successful in, in moving towards uh, the, the fishing community deciding on the regulations that would make the turtle harvests uh, more sustainable. And um, it came from the bottom up and, and was passed. And now the, the undoubtedly the turtle populations will benefit. And it was so successful there that Marine Conservation Society are now using it in, um, to do with the marine uh, protected area uh, designation uh, outreach uh, uh, efforts in UK coastal communities where, and, and they've got some beautiful films online, uh, you know, and, and, and actually properly gathering voices that aren't from Bristol, but with real accents. Uh, from those places and uh, you know especially for, for communities like like fishing communities when fishing people fish so they're not there it's hard to bring them all together uh, but if you can get them all sequentially and edit them together in a film and then people can see it and again especially now with social media you know that you can actually reach lots of people in the community and they can hear voices from their own community. Fiona I'm, I wondered what uh what your take might be on um, overcoming some of the, the barriers and, and new ways of working, new ideas to overcome some of the challenges that we've been talking about to, to get that very rich store of voices that, that you've got in the Mass Observation Archive out to that wider audience. I think um, some of the most successful projects that I have worked on that have been funded um, by either research councils or heritage lottery or, or trusts have been the ones that have worked with a group from the start, sort of throw out any assumptions about what that project may end up being, what the outcome will be, um, and throw out any assumptions about um, what we may get from it as an institution, as an archive. Those have been the most successful ones. And I think they're the ones that we kind of hold dear to us um, for example, my colleague developed a, a fabulous project called Beyond Boxes, which was about engaging communities that wouldn't normally have or find access to archival collections easy. So she worked with um, our local housing trust, working with street homeless and enabling them to actually come into the archives and look at the material that was in there and then to undertake projects to either record or write about their lives. That also kind of has worked with prisoners. Is so it going into our local prison? And again, using the voices of people from other backgrounds, but also people very similar to them, um, and seeing that those voices being recorded is a valorization of who they are and their own background, and then collecting their writing and encouraging them to write poetry and creative writing to be self reflective. Very frustrated when people come to us and say, you know, we want, um, we want some life stories, life writing of this kind of person, this kind of person who's had this kind of experience. And I think, actually, no, there's this huge, rich, collection of material why don't you read their stories and then let the story come out of it so i guess it's about really trying to dig under the surface and and find out what's there you know what stories are there to be told without sort of um yeah without sort of superimposing your perception of what might be there it's, it's, it's finding out what actually exists and, and listening to those voices listening to the challenges that they have to face in these in these traditionally you know beautiful stunning places that you know that exist in the countryside um but yeah, i think it is it is a difficult question i think it's going to take a lot of work 
I think that the key thing really is to be prepared to, to listen to some of those voices and give them the platform to, to tell their stories. Well, I think then one of the big take home messages of our chat has been that, you know, keep an open mind, leave your assumptions to one side because the, the stories are out there if we just seek out those lived experiences in some perhaps places where we might not think to look at first. So thank you very much, uh, Fiona, Louisa, Brendan and Coral. Bye. Bye. For more information about OCA, further events, and how you can collaborate across the entertainment, research, and social impact sectors, go to OCA.org and follow us at OCA Social. See you next time.